In this video, I will be splitting the cliffs into tiles and setting up attributes for importing into Unreal. I'm going to temporarily delete this color attribute to make things a bit more visible. So let's add an attribute delete and then under point attributes, let's select that color. There we go. Now we can see the geometry a bit more clearly whilst we work. I'm also just color it purple. So these two nodes are just how we develop the tools. They won't be part of the HDAs or part of the TOPS network. So let's add an attribute wrangle. I want to run over primitives. And I want to create a name for each one of my cliffs, kind of like an ID, so I can easily identify which cliff section is which. And I'm going to use this class attribute in that name. This is just more for kind of practical purposes. If I need to troubleshoot something further on on the line, I've therefore kind of assigned a name that's somewhat recognizable to each one of my cliffs. So I'm going to create a string attribute called name. And I want the name to begin cliff underscore. And then be combined with that class attribute. Now, this class attribute is an integer, so I need to convert it to a string. And I can do that by typing itoa open brackets. This is here. This will convert an integer to a string. So I'm converting this class attribute to a string. And then combining it with the prefix cliff underscore. Now, if we come look at our geometry spreadsheet, we've now got that string attribute here, cliff underscore 227. That's the class attribute that is on this cliff. So now I want to be able to split up this kind of large cliff section into some smaller tiles because I don't want to import such a large single piece of geometry into Unreal. I'd like these to be kind of small, more manageable sections. So first of all, I'm just going to drop down a grid. And let's make this say 100 by 200. Let's turn on wireframe. And then I want to split this up into a grid. So let's set this to 5 by 3. So here I have a grid that's 100 units by 200. And I have grid squares that are 50 by 50. And as the grid changes size, I want to increase the number of rows and columns to maintain that 50 by 50 grid size. So let's link these together. Drag and drop the size X into the columns parameter and then select relative reference and do the same for the size in Y. So drop that into rows and select relative channel reference. And if I zoom in, you'll see we've got some very small grid squares. We want them 50 by 50. So let's divide these by 50 and in the columns as well, divide 50. And I wanted grid squares that are 50 by 50, but as you can see, we haven't got that. And that's because for the columns, for instance, we've got two. And that's column one, column two. So I actually need to add an additional value of one. So let's do that. So there we go. Now we've got the correct number of, of grids here. So we've got a row here, one, two, three of the grid lines, and same with the columns, five, one, two, three, four, five because these rows and columns refer to the edges. So now, as this changes size, it kind of subdivides to give keep roughly a 50 by 50 grid. Now, of course, I'm not going to be setting this grid size manually. I'm going to have it, I want it to match the size of my cliff. So rather than referencing the size of my grid, I want to reference the size of my cliff. So let's add a null here. We're going to call this input. And then on our grid, let's add a spare input. 
and drag and drop this null into our spare input. And to better kind of visualize this, let's, after our grid, add a match size and add our input as a second input on the match size. And I want to scale to fit and uncheck uniform scale. So now I'm using this match size to scale our grid to match the size of our cliff. Now if we come back to the grid, I'm going to change this reference to the channel Y size to an expression called binding box, open brackets, and type minus one. And minus one refers to our first spare input here. Comma D underscore Z size. And then replace the reference to the next channel with bounding box, open brackets, minus one, comma D underscore X size. Close brackets. And I'm also going to change 50 to 100. So we have a grid size of 100 by 100. Just to illustrate, I'm going to add a transform so that I can scale up my cliff. And as I scale it up, you'll see this grid size will, check, will increase the number of rows and columns so that we continually have roughly a grid size of 100 by 100. Now after the match size, let's add an extract centroid and run over primitives so now i get a point at the center of each one of my grid cells and i want to add a connectivity to create a class attribute on those points so these now each point will have a unique integer now i'm going to transfer that attribute to my cliffs so add an attribute transfer and connect the connectivity to the second input and we can uncheck primitives and under points type class and that will have transferred the class attribute to my cliff geometry and to visualize that attribute let's quickly add an attribute wrangle and type in at cd equals and then create a random value with the class attribute as a seed and this will assign a random color to each one of my tiles. Now we can't see anything, and that's because on our attribute transfer, we need to come over to conditions and uncheck distance threshold. Because currently we have a distance threshold of 10, and that's extremely low for the size of our cliff. So let's just uncheck that. And now that color is visualizing that transferred class attribute. Now I'm going to promote that class attribute to primitives. So add an attribute promote. And then we want to add the class attribute and promote it to primitives. And update the attribute wrangle to run over primitives. And I'm going to change the promote method to maximum. This will just avoid um, Kind of any mismatches along the edges here where two class attributes meet and then i'm going to create an attribute wrangle and call this unreal name attribute so what i'm going to do is take this name we created earlier on and just transfer it to an attribute called unreal output name so it's a string attribute so begins with s at unreal I put name is equal to name and we need to run this over primitives so there we go we have this unreal I put name and then I'm going to append on the end an underscore followed by the class attribute we created for the tile and I'm also going to need to convert that to a string So here what I've done is I've taken the name attribute that we had made previously and then added our class attribute that we just created on that point to split it up into tiles as a suffix on the end. So for example if we look in the geometry spreadsheet 
we can see we've got a name here. It's Cliff227 and it's tile zero. When we scroll down, we've also got tile one. And again, this just helps identify these tiles just in case I need to do any troubleshooting. And also, this is assigning it to an attribute called Unreal Output Name. If we look at the documentation and come down here, we can see we've got some different attributes we can send from Houdini to Unreal. And this documentation will tell you the name of the attribute as well as what class you need to use, whether it needs to be uh, points, primitives, detail attribute, um, and also whether the attribute should be a string, a float, or an integer. And here we have Unreal Output Name. And Houdini Engine will use this attribute to name the static mesh that is generated when the digital asset is baked. And there are also some other attributes we can add. For instance, we want this to be a nanite mesh. So we can add an attribute that will tell Unreal to enable nanite on the geometry that we generate. And we can also create an attribute that will set the bake folder that we want our geometry to be baked to. And this is useful, so we don't have to um, manually set this on our digital asset inside of Unreal. I'm also going to specify the Unreal material that I want to use on this geometry. And using uh, attributes like these are extremely useful, especially when we're generating large amounts of geometry. We don't want to have to manually set the material on each one of these pieces of tiles, because we're potentially going to generate hundreds of pieces of geometry. So we want to automatically assign things like materials and names to them so we can keep them organized and uh, updated. So let's add an attribute create. First attribute I'm going to create is called Unreal Nanite enabled. And I want to do this on primitives and it's going to be an integer. I want to set the value to one. And that's a value of true or false, with one being true, zero being false. And then we can hit the plus to add another attribute. Second one I want to add is Unreal Bake Folder. This is also on primitives and is a string. I'm just going to type the path I want. So game Pegasus landscape cliffs and the final one I'm adding is unreal material this is also going to be on primitives and is also a string and for this unreal material attribute I want a reference to the material that I'm going to use in unreal so let's switch back to unreal for a second and come back to that material instance that we made in the previous video now I'm going to right click on this material and come down to copy reference and then switch back to Houdini and then we can paste in that reference to the material from Unreal. And finally I'm going to add, as I did before, an attribute delete just to make sure I delete any unnecessary attributes. So I want to delete non-selected, I want to keep position and color i also want to keep our normal attribute they're on our vertices and i want to keep all of our unreal attributes so there we go we've got our unreal attributes on the primitives we've got a normal attribute on the vertices just come back up here just disable that color that attribute delete which was deleting our color attribute so there we go, those are all the attributes we want to output. Finally, let's add a group delete. Just delete all of our groups, because we don't need those anymore. And let's add another output. On our attribute delete, I also want to keep that class attribute as well. It's on our primitives. So selecting everything from our input down to our output. So our input is selected along with everything else down to our output, which is also selected. And let's convert this to a subnet. 
We're going to call this one Highfield Cliff Split. And before we finish, I just want to visualize those tiles. So let's add another attribute wrangle. And in our wrangle, type at cd equals rand class. And run this over primitives. And let's just temporarily delete that color attribute again. Now we can see we've got our tile. And I'm just going to take my high field cliffs and plug that into the attribute delete just to illustrate what we're going to be importing into Unreal. So we'll begin by taking our high field, extracting the cliffs from the high field and converting them to geometry. Then have each one of those cliffs as a work item, export a displaced high poly version of our cliffs, and then slice them all up into evenly sized tiles to import into Unreal. So in the next video, I'm going to be converting these subnets to digital assets.